Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi, everybody. I'm Joel Simmons for another Earthworks Podcast. I am uh, very uh, honored today to have the team with me. And we're going to be talking about a fairly unique subject, uh, a little esoteric, a little heavy, but I hope we can turn it into something that makes sense. We're going to be talking about what we've always talked about, which is biological soil management, but with a new terminology that we're calling eco-adaptive chemistry uh, or eco-adaptive chemistry technology. And this is a term that uh, our friend Lawrence Mayhew was here with us, our chemist, along with uh, our brain trust from Earthworks, Jack Higgins. Uh, we're going to discuss this today and talk about how this really works. And what we're really talking about is how a soil really works. We've been using since very beginning of Earthworks the term biological soil management. I've always been of the assumption that Jerry Brunetti came up with that, although I'm guessing that he might not have, but it's okay because it's a term that makes sense. And what we're really talking about is, is using the biological fraction of that soil to really make the plant environment work effectively. Uh, in our presentations, we always talk about things like the three-legged stool, how chemistry affects physics, which ultimately sets up the environment for soil biology. That's the foundation of regenerative agriculture, which is extremely uh, popular right now in the agricultural community. And what we're really trying to, uh, to compare this or contrast this to is what is, is typically used in academia uh, under the model of the scientific model or reductionist chemistry. And let me try to explain that. This is something that we've discussed from day one here at Earthworks. Reductionist chemistry is where we take a big picture and we try to reduce it down to this one little entity that basically can describe why this thing works or why something works. It's still used very extensively in academia. And unfortunately, uh, as we can test, uh, it doesn't work in a dynamic environment. And interestingly enough, Jerry's business uh, back in the 70s, he named it Agrodynamics because he understood how complex this, this phenomenon is of what's going on in the, in the soil. Um, Jack and I had an opportunity to, um, uh, to watch a movie the other day that I encourage everybody to watch called The Fantastic Fungi. And it talks about how mycelium uh, works under the soil and communicates with plants. And it's extremely dynamic. It's not reductionist in any way. In fact, it's the exact opposite of reductionism. It takes a very small entity and, and it moves it upward and, and allows this reaction underneath our feet to really uh, perform its magic. We don't fully understand it, but we know for a fact, and anybody that's really worked in soils for any length of time knows that reductionist science does not work in a biological environment. So if we're stuck in this world of trying to reduce everything down to the smallest little entity because we're stuck on the scientific model and we have to reduce it all down to this is how this works, it's never going to work if we're going to talk about biological so uh, soil management and if we're going to talk about uh, you know, dynamics of soils. All of us in the turf industry are agronomists, at least to an extent. Uh, we're all chemists. We're all biologists. Uh, you know, we're all horticulturalists. These are all dynamic sciences, and these are sciences that are all inspired by nature. And to understand what's really going on is difficult. And quite honestly, in our lifetimes, we're not going to truly understand this concept of, of how a soil really works because it is so incredibly dynamic. So what we want to talk about today, and I, again, I've brought, uh, I've brought our powerhouse on. Uh, I'm not a chemist. Uh, I might play one on the radio here, uh, but I happen to have a very close friend and a compadre who is a chemist, Mr. Lawrence Mayhew, who uh, everybody that's been following us here on the podcast. And again, if you haven't been listening and uh, subscribing, please do. But Lawrence is a chemist, and so we can get into the chemistry side a little bit more. Um, Jack is certainly uh, one of our brain trusts and has a uh, really gotten very passionate about how this concept works and has, has seen a lot of it. So what we want to have a conversation about today 
is a terminology that has come to fruition in our industry that we call eco-adaptive chemistry. And what we're trying to do here is come up with a definition of how this really works. And, and as, as you guys have heard us talk about a number of times, every Monday, uh, the Earthworks team of agronomists gets the pleasure of spending an hour having our brains smashed into small pieces by Lawrence. And this past Monday, uh, we started talking about this term, eco-adaptive uh, chemistry. And I think to a T, and Jack, I think you'll agree with me on this, to a T, we all kind of got really excited about this term because here's a term that I think we can start to really uh, help to understand and explain uh, the dynamics of the soils that everybody listening is dealing with. You are not dealing with a reductionist environment. You are not dealing with, if you put down this one little element of, of, of nitrogen, it's going to change the whole world. Your system is dealing with many, many elements. Your system is dealing with millions, if not billions of microorganisms, all of which have to work in unison. Your system is, is communicating from plant to, to microbe. Uh, we've talked about geophagy in the past. All of these systems are what we've been talking about for the longest time. And that's what we want to do today is have a very geeky conversation about how a soil really works. And, um, and having said all of that, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the page over to Lawrence, um, our, our chemist. Uh, and, uh, and Lawrence, you sent to us an article um, by, um, by Irina Pemanova, and I'm probably saying that wrong from the uh, International Humic Society. And I'm probably saying that wrong too, but uh, in her in her presentation, she actually coined that phrase, eco-adaptive chemistry. Um, help us understand a little bit further uh, as to what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> what, what does that mean? And 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 from your standpoint, from a chemist standpoint, uh, and again, we've had this conversation about humic acids a couple of times here on the podcast, but help us all understand uh, from your perspective, eco-adaptive chemistry. Uh, the, the term grew out of the uh, chemistry industry uh, using what they call green chemistry. And green chemistry has been around just for a few years now. And it, and it refers to the processes that chemists use in order to analyze uh, things or to synthesize stuff. And the chemistry that I was, you know, uh, trained to use was pretty nasty, <laughs> uh, you know, chromates and all these sort of things that uh, generally kill stuff. Uh, the green chemistry takes a more benign approach to manufacturing, synthesizing, analyzing. So let's don't let's don't analyze. Let's say a soil sample. Let's analyze a soil sample with something really nasty and then throw it away. Where does it go from there? Green chemistry. Uh, looks at chemistry processes from the context of what is more benign to our environment and sustainability. So coming out of that concept is this new concept called eco-adaptive chemistry or eco-adaptive technology. And the idea is let's look at natural systems. Let's observe natural systems. How do they actually work? They, they don't work by exchanging chemicals. Uh, that's not how these systems work. They work by exchanging and cooperating and interacting with minerals. They interact with microbes. They interact with plant roots. The plant roots send out exudates. These exudates are releasing chemicals that support biological activity in the soil, microbiological activity. And those microbes in turn release materials that support the plant. So they don't call it symbiosis, but it sure sounds like symbiosis. Right. So, so we look at these systems in terms of interactions, and these interactions rarely, if ever, involve a pure orthophosphate, for example. They, they rarely, rarely involve a, uh, a acid that's releasing hydrogen protons like a mineral acid would. Instead, we see totally different mechanisms involved. So from those observations, how do we mimic nature in what we're doing to crops, what we're doing to grasses, what we're doing on turf, what we're doing to the environment? Now, let's look at the bigger picture and come up with systems and materials and products and methods and programs that are 
actually cooperating with and respecting nature. So that's the basis of the eco-adaptive chemistry. And it's a lot to learn. You said, like you said, there's so much to learn about soils. We can, we'll probably never hit the stage where we say, oh yeah, we understand soil in our lifetime. I don't think that's possible at this point in our, in our history, <laughs> but the best we can do is observe these systems we know what works. We know what doesn't pollute, for example. You know, so let's let's concentrate on things and, that we and know let them are do their magic. Let leave let them, them alone. Turn them loose. Them yeah, move. it's more to do with balance than it is it has more to do with balancing systems rather Careful than with that. We'll get, more. We'll get criticized by using the word balance. Oh, <laughs> the turf the turf bullies will come after us if we try mm -hmm. to balance soils. They don't work. That's that. Oh terrible. well, their proof, their evidence is that it doesn't work, right? And, right, and exactly. their, their proof and their evidence is based upon conventional approaches. Yeah. Exactly. Well, let me interject with a question, okay. guys. Um, if so, to to kind of to kind of give an example of what mm, standard chemistry or or not ecoadaptive chemistry is in, in the agronomy world, let's say that we're talking with um, a salt like calcium nitrate. Uh, it's a cation and an anion, both of which are desired, you know, by the plant, uh, and and they go out as fertilizer. So, um, in the understanding of of regular chemistry, that's a soluble salt, right? So it goes yeah. out and ionizable, um, soluble. And, yes. yes, and and now mm -hmm. and now that salt turns into two ions in solution. Right. There, there's one ion, and there's what they call a counter ion. Okay, mm -hmm. so, um, so you know, it it's easy to kind of understand and and to reproduce in a lab that 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 salt is is soluble and turns into these ion and counter ion. But mm -hmm. what do we if if we put it in the lens of eco adaptive chemistry? And in the presence of humic substances, uh, and, and also living organisms, plants, and and soil biology, what can we um, what can we observe that happens in that root system? Energy transfer. Okay, that's totally and, different than relying on ions and counter ions to supply quote. And that's available. a bit esoteric. So explain that. Well, in, in natural systems, there's this thing called ion, or I'm sorry, electron shuttling. In other words, it's thermodynamics is what drives these systems. If it's not thermodynamically feasible, which most soluble chemicals aren't, then the system needs to either get rid of those highly soluble chemicals or adapt to them somehow. But in natural systems, uh, you see electron transfer happening among these different components of soils, living and non-living things, and it's an energy transfer thermodynamically driven system. Well, that's a lot different than let's put on a very highly soluble chemical and the plants will suck them up. It's not that way. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't even work that way in your body. You no. don't if you this morning ate a lot of highly soluble substances like salt and sugar, you got a problem, right? <laughs> what do you mean? What yeah. do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you look at your breakfast this morning and everything on your plate was was hydrophobic. It was insoluble in water. And it's introduced. Don't be knocking in, my fruity pebbles, man. <laughs> it's introduced in your in your system where where microbes take over right away in the stomach and in the intestine and convert these things into nutrients. Same thing in the soil system. That's not relying on a highly soluble ion. Yeah, it, that's that's not the way even we function. That's not even the way we eat. And plants are the same way. Right. So so as opposed to as opposed to a chicken manure compost which mm -hmm. does have both calcium and nitrate mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the compost, but- Not to mention it, a whole bunch of other minerals. Not to mention a whole bunch of other stuff, but it is not, but it's not a totally <clears throat> soluble- No. Um, it's mm -hmm. not a totally soluble input. Look, so at it, the low, look at the low numbers on your tag guarantee. Right. That's exactly. right. You know, let's talk yeah. about that, Lawrence, because this is one of the things that Jerry was so big on. And, and if you look at the- um, you know, the diagram on, on, um, on Irina's um, a paper on eco-adaptive chemistry, she uses this word complex biogeosystems. 
And, and that's yeah. one of the things that we've been very strongly focused on here at Earthworks. And Jerry brought that to our table. But, you know, you know, if you bring into this, you know, this complex of chemistry and sustainability, uh, green chemistry, uh, naturally inspired technology, and then this complex geochemistry or geosystems, talk about the importance of the geo part of that, the, the mineral part of that in a natural soil science. And this would be true of even even the lowest of CECs. I mean, in our industry, we build a lot of soils out of straight sand. There's not a lot of geo in there, which is why we are so adamant about trying to reintroduce mineral components to that and how it works within this, uh, this adaptive uh, environment. I think limestone or calcium carbonate is a good example of that. Uh, if you apply limestone to a soil system, the microbes do not recognize it because it's a rock and it's well right. below, it's, it's buried under tons and tons of earth feet. You know, it, it's not it's in the natural system. Yeah, it's bedrock. And that's not easily converted to, let's say a calcium source. Uh, its primary use should be pretty restricted in, in sustainable systems to trying to correct pH, acid pH, because it will release a calcium cation, but it releases a carbonate and the carbonate acts with the acid in the soil and makes water and CO2. But it neutralizes. Yeah, but that's a chemical reaction. That's not a biological reaction. But microbes and plants require what we call a bioavailable source of calcium. What is that? It's usually what they call a biogenic mineral. It's something that was produced by biology in the first place. And it just so happens to be a polymorphic form of calcium carbonate called calcite. So calcite is a, is a mineralized form of calcium that occurs in soils naturally and cycles through the soil, not rock limestone. So that explains why you cannot use limestone as a source of bioavailable calcium. It doesn't because work. It's not bioavailable. That's it's not. no bio not. in the rock. But right. you know the importance of having these minerals there so that the soil can react to these minerals rock phosphate would be another good example right i mean having rock phosphate yeah. in the soil is not available but no. it is going to be reacted on by the the dynamics of what the soil is doing and it's, you know it's the same example right it's a corrective it's an amendment it's not a fertilizer but right. it's it's called appetite which is a complex calcium phosphate associated with a unbelievable number of other minerals <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's called appetite and if you study the appetite minerals google appetite minerals you're going to find out it's associated with a lot of other things especially the rare earth elements and that is a very complex input into a more and that's a more sustainable approach to correcting phosphate let i remember talking to the mining engineer where i was up in canada a few years ago and he goes this stuff's this stuff isn't good for fertilizer. I, got, I know that. He says, so you're proposing to put it on the ground and bugs will eat it. And I go, hmm, yeah. Shocking. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> it's amazing what the soil will actually do for us. I mean, that was one of the things that I found so fascinating by watching that that documentary on the uh, on on mycelium, uh, you know, the fantastic fungi. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, they describe in great detail how this dynamic involvement of of microbiology goes after all this and and creates a level of communication and can share some of these nutrients back and forth from other plants and and we know this is happening within the turf industry within the turf environment mm -hmm. maybe not to the great extent that it is with the mighty oak trees but it's certainly a communication and a sharing uh and a digestion uh you know we've talked a lot about digestion in soils and the importance of having food sources to keep the microbial populations active it's all about creating this little compost pile and digesting uh all these you know not not only the carbon uh, inputs from, especially in a turf industry, but you know the minerals that we're we're supplying to the soil, so that the plant can get what it needs when it needs it. I'm glad you brought up the uh, term communication. Microbes do communicate. Microbes communicate. That's with heresy. Come on now. Other, uh, no, I, microbes communicate not only with each other but with the higher plants also. Yeah. Uh, I just read an article in uh, the journal Science where. 
the uh, standard practice when a oak tree that you mentioned uh, got diseased was to whack them down, get rid of them. But then the disease kept spreading. Sean. Well, this one researcher, this one brilliant researcher noticed that if you left the tree standing, there was less disease around that tree in years later, not months or weeks, but years later. So she discovered that the plant roots of the dying tree were sending out messages to the other, you know, healthy oak trees around them. We got a problem here and here's how you deal with it. And then the tree dies. That message was sent out. Now, it's not talking like we talk. It's Obviously. DNA. It's messenger RNA. It's 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 right. these mechanisms do exist. And that information is passed along. And it's and it's interconnected via that underground biological system. Um, you mm -hmm. know, a, a lot the, of the my, mycorrhizae that we use in, mm -hmm. in the earthworks yeah. products. Right. Her research indicated that it was primarily transmitted through the mycorrhizal association with the roots transmitted to other mycorrhizae who in, get, who in turn took it to other roots of, of the healthy trees in sure. these tree stands. It's you know, one fascinating. Of the, one of the things Brilliant. that I was most yeah. fascinated by watching the uh, you know, the fantastic fungi was when they talked about how a parent tree actually through this mycorrhizal or this, uh, you know, this, this network that they find underground communicates with its offspring and identifies its offspring and then can transfer nutrients. I mean, it's fascinating. It's really, they, they call really it nice. kin, kin recognition. They say so kin, recognition. If, yeah, if kin we, recognition. If, yeah. If we put on a highly soluble nitrogen, let's say that kills that communication that kills that network because the plant's going, Ooh, I don't have to do anything. Here's all this nitrogen for me right. to absorb. You know, so all these mechanisms kind of go away. Same thing for phosphorus. The the uh, the tree roots or the plant roots, the grass roots, no matter what they are, interacting with the uh, ectomycorrhizae will just shut down. In, in, and, and let me let me in, qualify that a little bit. I'm, we're not trying to suggest by any stretch that you know certainly in our industry that we're not going to be using these things. But what we are are really seriously trying to suggest is that if we manage the soil properly, we can reduce that input significantly. Takes two exactly. steps forward and only one mm -hmm. step backward. But if we don't manage the soil to a biological standard, a biological soil management approach, when we are faced with having to do something that is damaged, it's much like our body when we're very very, very sick, you know, I'm going to take an antibiotic. I know it's going to damage a lot of the biological activities in my body, but I'm going to take care of the acute issue. I'm going to, I'm going to move forward. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to start to rebuild, you know, uh, pro, you know, add a bunch of probiotics to my diet, you eat some yogurt, you know, just eat well, uh, you know, give up the fruity pebbles, you know, that kind of stuff and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and start going forward. But that's really what this is all about it. The eco adaptive, the soil is so incredibly adaptive, it can tolerate the worst of treatment and still bounce back because there is such a dynamic uh, industry, if you will, under our feet of this mycorrhizae, this, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the you know the entire biological environment that we don't know. We just need to, you know, allow it to do its thing and stop abusing it as badly as we do. Well, uh, my, 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 background, my background is with agriculture, primarily organic and sustainable systems. And what these systems do with highly soluble chemicals, synthetics, is they use them as a primer. In other words, you put a little bit up front during the early growth stages and germination of these plants and then allow the soil system to take over, provided you've balanced, you know, various minerals in there that do not have to necessarily be water soluble. So it primes the biological effect that you can search that in the literature too. It's a very legitimate term. So let's talk a little bit more about the Earthworks line of fertilizers, uh, of, sure. of biological fertilizers. So we've established very much um, the way that nature works um, and the way that a soil wants to work. We've also established that essentially what we do in both agriculture and in, in our world of turf and ornamental is not natural. <laughs> It's, right. it's it just it just isn't um right. however you're saying this, there weren't golf courses when the pilgrims came here that's right <laughs> however what we what we do at earthworks and and with this new term that defines it so well is that 
we try to adapt nature. We try to mimic natural systems. And, and so let, let's, let's put the lens of eco-adaptive chemistry into the way that, that Earthworks formulates and builds these biological, bioavailable fertilizers that, that we all have established um, are going out into systems that are not natural, but we are trying to mimic nature in bringing some some bringing the way a natural system wants to work to that property. And also yeah. understand that what mm -hmm. we're dealing with, Jack, is in primarily turf is botanically a pretty simple plant. So it's not nearly as complex as the mighty oak tree. So a little bit of adaptive chemistry goes a long way in our world. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, Lawrence, you and I were talking about the work you're doing right now on building that Earthworks flush product yeah. and, and how you're kind of, let's talk a little bit about that without necessarily trying to, to sell anything here, but to explain, you know, what your thought process is in the development of a new product designed specifically to help us move sodium out of the soil without completely destroying the soil. And of course, yeah. this revolves a lot around humic substances. Always, it seems to always do that. <laughs> well, Especially with every, you. Every product I ever developed yeah, exactly. has humic substances. <laughs> in it, so that's yeah. just kind of a given. Yes, Mr. Uh, Humate here. There's a, reason, there's a reason for that, a lot of reasons. But when I started approaching the Earthworks flush product, when you asked me to get involved in that, I first of all looked at how is this a accomplished conventionally. They want to get rid of sodium. They want to reduce their bicarbonate content. Well, they usually use sulfuric acid. And right away, as a chemist and as a geobiologist, I look at sulfate as being possibly a limiting factor in these systems because in natural systems, sulfates are in extremely low concentration. There are 99.99999% of the sulfur in a normal soil system is carbon-based. It's carbon-bound. It's an organic, it's part of an organic molecule. It's not a sulfate. You, you can rarely, if ever, find high sulfate contents in nature except around volcanoes or, or these vents in oceans. Yeah, there's sulfates there, but it's a rare event. So I did not want to use a, a sulfate, and I did not want to use a a high proton generating acid such as sulfuric acid. Now, I, I, I'm going back to my original comments about how we got to look at this as an electron shuttling system rather than burn them and flush them. <laughs> that's, right. just, that's nasty. You know, someday that'll probably be out loud. I don't know if on our lifetime or not, but somebody's going to look at that someday and say, oh my God, are you out of your mind? You know? <laughs> You're doing what? <laughs> and it's just the way we do things right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, let well, me just, let me qualify you know. this a little bit so nobody calls us up and starts trying to order this product. What we're trying to oh, do, oh yeah, is, <laughs> don't do that. I, I, please, I should please don't order up. this. Product. What we're trying to do is come up with a better chemistry that is more biologically uh, satisfying, if you will, uh, uh, comfortable, uh, and and we're playing with it. So mm -hmm. maybe by next year we'll have some stuff to do trial work. But but what we're trying to do, I mean, the point here is is that everything we're trying to do is going to fit into this biological soil management or now this eco adaptive. So if what we can do is develop a product that allows us to let mother nature be a part of the process, you know, nature inspired work and, and, and do it that way, as opposed to just go in there and rip the daylights out of everything and go from, you know, from, from ground zero and try to build everything back. We're, we're much further down the road. And I think we can get there. We've done it, you know, with other products and, you know, certainly the model of basically carbon-based fertility, which is allowing microbes to feed is a great start. And of course, you know, dousing them with minerals so that the minerals are there. Um, and we've all talked about geophagy a lot, which is this whole incredible science that we're starting to really understand how microbes and plants work together. That's what this is all about, eco-adaptive. I mean, make it work so the biology stays healthy and just continues to grow. And we've seen it as we've worked, and Jack will certainly contest that he's out in the field enough. As we start feeding the soil and getting biology on our side, 
you know, problems start to melt away. Guys sleep better at night. I mean, it's uh, thatch is digested. Nutrients are mobilizing faster. You know, I mean, feel free at any point, Lawrence, to jump in on the uh, humic acid concept because this is the really the backbone of a lot of this. And in fact, the backbone of this article that we're kind of addressing on eco-adaptive chemistry. But, you know, it's, it's this big dynamic that we've been talking about that is, you know, it is complex, but when you really kind of boil it down, it's really quite simple. Yeah, it seems to be the way that we as humans, as technology, as developers can adapt nature, can can adapt the the. See how ecosystem. we keep using that word, adapt? <laughs> I like that. That's why we, like we need it. to adapt uh, to nature. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so humic, yeah. humic substances seem to be a pathway for us to do that. Well, yeah, in natural systems, they are the ion shuttling system. They, they, are the, they are the process of moving energy from here to there, and in the meantime, releasing plant nutrients that are bioavailable. Very, very critical to these systems. Uh, it, it accounts for, the estimates run 75% to 90% of all the carbon in natural systems is in the in the form of humic substances. So they got to be there for a reason. And, and there's a lot of scientific knowledge on these things, how they detoxify, how they actually balance systems. They throw balance in there. They're great for balancing systems, trying to not let one thing overwhelm another. They'll, they'll capture this over there if, if there's too much of this, and they'll increase the bioavailability of this. If there's not like iron, Fe3 iron, the oxidized form of iron, which plants cannot use, is converted to Fe2, the reduced form of iron, in the presence of humic acids. Just one thing I thought I'd mention. So they, they, they play an extremely important role in preserving our environment. Qualify yeah, they this have a little not. bit, Lawrence, just because mm -hmm. I, I fear when we say things like, you know, applying humic substances that uh, mm -hmm. conventional wisdom would be, oh, well, then all we have to do is go out and spray or, or spread no. humic acid and, mm -hmm. and that solves all the problems. That's not what no. we're talking about here no. at all. No, so Rachel, I that's very that that's very reductionist thinking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When I when I started my profession in working with humic materials, Someone said, well, I'm just going to go spread it on my field. And I go, right. no, don't do that. The literature says that doesn't work. Well, the guy who sold it to me said, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> you know, I, he wants to sell tons. I yeah. want you to I want you to create a condition in your soil that's conducive to biological activity. And in order to do that, you need to combine these materials with something, combine it with calcium, combine it with phosphorus, combine it with something, N, P, and K, anything, but don't put it out there all by itself. Well, how much can I apply? So I took a section of my garden and I applied on a spot about yay big. I applied the equivalent of 12 ton per acre. And I saw, <laughs> I saw nothing, absolutely nothing. Wow. And the research shows that you get a benefit from humic substances, making N, P, and K more available to the plant to a degree, and then it levels off. So if you keep adding it and adding and adding it, you get no return. So there's this optimum, there's this point where nature works at an optimum level, and we need to try so to figure out. So what are we doing that's, uh, that's enhancing that? I mean, obviously, we're not just pounding the soils with Hume, but we're no, bringing in... No, no, you, lo you look on our label, and what are we, 1%, 2%, you know, somewhere right. in there. You know, it, it, it's, it's an extremely complex structure. It's a matrix. It's not a molecule. It's a matrix. And that has holding capacity, exchange capacity. It does so, so much. So we combine it through our blending processes that help blend these things together and make them more bioavailable once they're in the soil. So we're not adding humic materials all by themselves. I, their position in manufacturing and, and agriculture and turf should be, what do we combine this with that'll make whatever it is more bioavailable? That's the goal. for Let's using define humic. that term, Lawrence. We've used that a lot and I'm not ah, sure. Yeah. Everybody fully understands that, but let's let's get into that term bioavailability because we use it a lot. And you know, we're we're you know we might not see the trees because we're stuck in the forest here. So let's yeah. let's get a, a better common definition of bioavailability and, and the functionality of bioavailability. Yeah, it's uh, it's similar to, but not quite the same thing as availability, which is usually defined basically solubility uh, only in the context of solubility so a, a three four five fertilizer would have three percent four percent five percent soluble n p and k in it 
Now, the theory behind that is that the more soluble it is, the more likely a plant will take it up. And it doesn't work that way. It never has worked that way, but yet that's how fertilizers are sold. If you see a very low guarantee on something, it means that uh, it's more than likely going to be taken up by the soil system in a, in a more benign manner, and it's probably not going to be that disturbing to it. And it's, it's, well, let's take the calcium in chicken manure. I doubt very much if that's calcium carbonate. I don't no. think that's calcium sulfate. <laughs> you know, it's going to be tied to a carbon molecule of some sort, or it's going to be a calcite. It's going to be wrapped up with a lot of things that the chicken gut put together in addition to calcium. And then we run it through a simple test tube analysis and out comes the calcium number at 3% or 5%. Actually which... about 15%, to be honest with you. Thank you. The for, calcium for... is pretty high in, uh, especially Ooh. egg layers. Because ah, we, egg uh, layer. Yes. Because we feed right. a lot of calcium. And what, what are they feeding them? They're feeding them calcium carbonate. Which gets uh, converted. Which is converted exactly. not only in the bird, <laughs> but then we don't forget, we're also composting this. So, so we, hit it, we hit it with more microbiology. The term bioavailability is rooted in this concept that the biological organisms that come in contact, whether it be microbe, plants, or whatever, or all these, all these things floating around the soil system, will convert at, into some form that can be taken up by plants. A fraction of that will be taken up by plants. And that's the bioavailability concept. It's a result of interactions, soil interactions, rather than pour on something that's soluble and hope it doesn't tie up before the plant grows. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Now, um, I, I want, we've talked a lot about how this is a very efficient system for delivering <clears throat> nutrients to the plant of bi bioavailability. Uh, I want to put my tree hugger hat on for a second here. Uh -oh. <laughs> because, because this is also, you know, we, Joel told me right from the very start of working here 13 years ago, Joel, mm. so that, um, that thought? we were an organic fertilizer company and it is good for the environment, but we do it because it works for the plant. Well, let's go back to it being good for the environment as well. The, you mentioned um, you mentioned that that the humic substances account for seventy five percent or more of the carbon in a soil system. That carbon is coming from photosynthesis, right? From and, the atmosphere. And yeah. From the atmosphere, from mm -hmm. that excess carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, and yeah. it's and and it's being <laughs> locked. It's being, it's being transformed and deposited into the soil system where it's beneficial. Primarily, but by a whole biological system, of course, the plant play is, is, the, is the first pathway. It, need, it <clears throat> needs to photosynthesize to get there, but it's being, but it's being locked in and, and deposited by primarily this mycorrhizal system. Um, and I find that so awesome and then I also find, uh, then I'm also so proud that, uh, that, that the Earthworks product really helps make that happen. Um, and, and that all that, that these golf courses and sports fields and lawn care companies using these products um, really are, are building topsoil, building humic substances that are beneficial to the entire environment. It's awesome. I might add that it takes time to build to build humic substances, but in the meantime, you're generating all these precursors or these intermediates that will eventually turn in. Yeah, that you are certainly doing. Mm -hmm. you know, you're producing intermediates that are highly stable carbon forms, and eventually they will become humified. It takes a while for that part. <laughs> right, right. Um, but but, but if we put on compost, we're putting on a form of humified materials to begin with. So it's, now what uh, are we, now 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 let's look at the other side of that coin. Mm -hmm. If we put on highly soluble inputs that are shocking to the biological system, yeah. we're we're destroying humic substances. We're destroying topsoil, particularly nitrogen, highly yeah. soluble nitrates and ammonium. Yeah. 
there. Which is which and is urea, why it's urea. so important. And I think yeah. you're seeing. Um, and again, we're, we're you know we're, we're certainly not trying to make the podcast a commercial for Earthworks, but it, it's a good way for us to describe what we're, we're we're talking about here. Is that you know what we're doing is we're trying to bring carbon into the picture, and and it's fascinating to me after 35 years of doing what we've been doing how much of the industry is starting to have that conversation. You're seeing humic acids being part of very conventional synthetic fertilizers, which yeah. is a great start. You're mm -hmm. seeing more blending with carbon-based materials. You're hearing that word carbon-based. You're hearing that word, uh, you know, biological this and biological that. And unfortunately, you know, there's still mm -hmm. a lot of misleading information. And that's what we're trying to hopefully accomplish in, in, you know, with the podcast is just helping to get, you know, help people understand the, the, the dynamics of this, you know, and, and I keep going back to this reductionist chemistry. And I, I share this story a lot in when I do academies, um, you know, I have a dear friend who works in a uh, laboratory that makes perfumes. And we have constantly battled over the years, over the value of the scientific method. And I keep, you know, she reduces everything down to this one little thing, that creates the scent that she needs. It's complete, beautiful reductionist chemistry. And then I keep trying to say, but that's not how your body works. That's not how the soil works. It's the exact opposite. It's this huge dynamic of biological activity. And then, you know, and again, it, it and, you know, we're getting to the point where the soil can be adaptive. And in our environments, the adaption that the adaption, I don't know if that's the right word, but the ability to adapt to what we do is huge and what we're trying to do is is create a, a a the process by which the soil can adapt so much faster that's what carbon-based fertility that's what biological soil management is we're never going to see a change where you know we're never even suggesting that we're not going to use some levels of nitrogen synthetic nitrogen but what we are suggesting is that we're going to buffer all of that uh, biologically by bringing to the table uh, this huge populations of microbes so that when we do, you know, have to take a step backwards, we can still move a step and a half forward and be way ahead of the cycle. And, and, and to me, again, I'm just trying to get this, this term of eco-adaptive chemistry or technology uh, established in people's minds so that they understand that what we're trying to do is create buffers uh, for the, you know, for environment, for bad water. I mean, one of the things that we battle all the time, and we've talked about it, certainly in our agronomy meetings, just the bad water that our, our clients are dealing with. They're dealing with some of the worst waters you've ever seen. I saw a water the other day that, that had salts well over 1,200. Uh, which I don't, I'm not sure wouldn't burn turf just by putting that water out. Mm. What's that doing to uh, eco-adaptive biology, if you will, mm. in, you know, in the soil profile? <laughs> Feel free, jump in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, this is not an advertisement. This is three guys that have a strong philosophical position. And passion. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. passion as to what we do for a living. Mm -hmm. and, and what we do as professionals. So it's, it's a philosophical basis for going forward. That's yeah, that's right. It, it, um, yeah. And, and I mean, if you are pumping out water that is just mm -hmm. loaded with salt like that, 1200 parts per million salt concentration, uh, you, you better hope that you have a, um, you better hope that you have a, a biological system and, and humic substances in your root zone that can buffer, that can, uh, that, so that the plant is not just completely saturated in that salt. Yeah, they're sitting in salt the whole time. I, I use the term buffering all the time, and I, yeah. I get asked to define that, and I'm not sure I've ever really been able to define that very well, but I think that's mm -hmm. where we're going right now. Is, and, and I think the salty water concept is a good one, is that by, you know, by constantly flooding the root zone with this very high salt content, uh, without these humic substances, without carbon base, without an ample ability of microbiology to be able to rebound from this high sodium. I mean, just, I mean, it's common sense. If, you know, you put sodium on any living thing, it's going to dehydrate it. It's going to ultimately kill it. If we drink too much salt water, we're going to we dehydrate and it's going to kill us. I mean, um, is that a fair, uh, is that a fair terminology in, in uh, Lawrence? And in, in when I use the word buffering, I mean, how would you define, uh, you know, I, I think you understand where I'm going here. How would you define that term buffer? <laughs> 
buffering buffering is balancing uh it's not oh. necessarily restricted to ph i mean we're all heavily trained in buffering ph trying to keep ph in systems within a narrow range and that became our term for buffering but there's biological buffering right you know, there's organic matter buffering there there's buffering mm -hmm. between chemicals in soil systems in other words nature wants to be in a certain optimal range it doesn't want to be too high it doesn't want to be too low plants want to be in these ranges microbes want to be in these ranges so it's all buffered it's buffered primarily by organic matter content in soils that's the ticket and I learned this many, many, many years. Sometimes you, as, as uh, advising farmers, you get into situations that are impossible. For example, they have like 90% 90, 90 base saturation of calcium. Someone came in there and sold them the calcium story and they overdid it. You know, mm -hmm. now that's not reversible. There, there's no way that's going to be there forever. Yeah. And so what do you do? The only advice I could ever come up with besides selling your farm is you have to build up your organic matter content, which will help buffer that, that extreme condition that you have there. It's buffering. It, it's, it's getting things in balance. That's what buffering is all about. We're going to get ourselves into a lot of trouble. Keep using that word. <laughs> Why? The bullies will come after me and start twittering me away and saying, bring it on. is high here, but that's good. I mean, <laughs> let's talk about that. I mean, it's, you know, one of the things that we struggle with is the dynamic between I'm a plant person or I'm a soils person. Um, and, and there uh, really is no distinction. I, I've always been baffled by this. You know, <clears throat> uh, I've always used the phrase, well, you're stuck in the plant box. And a lot of academics, uh, you know, want to say, well, we don't have to worry about the soil. We're just worried. We're going to feed the plant and foliar feed. Even the term foliar feeding is is more marketing than it is really science, especially in the turf industry where we, you know, have a, a blade of grass that's an eighth of an inch tall and we're putting two gallons of water over its head <laughs> and expecting yeah. it to be all foliar. It's not foliar. It's still going to the soil. Microbes yeah. eat at the table first. That was one of the first things that Jerry Brunetti taught me was microbes eat at the table first. I'm not sure I understood it at first because I was so naive, but it, it makes perfect sense mm -hmm. now. But when we do this, you know, when anytime we put down a fertilizer, it's going to go through microbial degradation. And this concept of, of, you know, everything being about the plant and that the soil is irrelevant and it's just a mechanism by which to hold roots is baffling to me because <laughs> that's not how the system works. The soil is, is everything and the plant is just part of the system. Well, if you go back in the literature, like during the 1930s and 40s, it's soil is only there to support the plant. Right. That's all it does. <laughs> and you go, wow, right. we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> Thank God. You know, we have, and we're seeing that, yeah. but it's still, yeah. there's still so much uh, Neanderthalism about this whole well, model that, sorry, I just got You know, they never disappeared. Trouble. What? No, they no, never they, disappeared. Yeah, they're within all of us. So they're, I mean, they're, they're but you know, three, that's three percent of the genetics in Europe is Neanderthal. Right. <laughs> they never disappeared. Yeah, they got absorbed into our. But we, what were we told when we went to college? They went extinct, right? They didn't. They right. got absorbed into the general population. Right. Exactly. Ah. And they're still here. But, but you oh. know, that's really the bigger <laughs> conversation. Sorry. Let's be careful no. now. This is a public. I'm only talking course. morphology here. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. But, but again, it goes back to, uh, you know, the, the fact that the soil is, 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 it's hard to understand. I mean, it's, it's. It's probably the most complex ecosystem on the face of the earth. There bar none. I mean, mm -hmm. there just isn't anything this complex, and it's really hard to understand, uh, especially not, when you say, hey, yeah. if I raise this, and then it, then it pushes that down. There's antagonism in soil. Some things fight each other. It's but hydrodynamics. If, I mean, yeah, it, but, but, if this, but if this is needed over here, and it's antagonizing that over, how do we, ah, you know, next thing you know, it, you, it comes back to the same answer. Organic matter. Organic yes. matter is there for a reason. And that's how it, okay, aluminum, for example, aluminum is very toxic, but in the presence of organic matter, humic substances, it detoxifies aluminum. Aluminum is the third most abundant element on the face of the earth, and it's toxic. Now, how do we do this? How do we survive as, as anything, as a tree, as a human, as a blade of grass, in the presence of so much aluminum? Uh-huh. These systems got this figured out, believe me. <laughs> so 
that, yeah, we just that, look at aluminum as being more available, more soluble when the acid content goes up, pH goes down, acid goes up. It's eh, to a degree. Yeah, that's true. But uh, it's buffered by biological systems. It's buffered by organic matter, which is produced by biological systems. Yeah, which is, so which it, all, is it all comes really back to biology. It all comes back to let's look at the biology because that's that's what helps us out here. That's what supports us. You know, how do they, how do, they do this? Well, I don't know, but let's <laughs> let's build it up in our favor. <laughs> This might be a tangent, but it's really not. It's all, it is about organic matter. It's about humic substances. It's a very difficult concept to understand. It's something that we've discussed before, but I'd like to get it out there again. Are you ready? Um, so humic substances are very uh, important at maintaining soil structure and supporting water retention capacity. Yeah. Yet they're hydrophobic. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so let's talk about, let's talk they're about amphiphilic. They're not hydrophobic. They're amphiphilic. Yeah. Let's talk about amphiphilic hydrophobicity, um, hot, maybe hydrophobic interactions, mm -hmm. um, and, and how it relates to water retention. Define mm -hmm. that f term for us, Lauren, so that we all understand. What Oil and water. Oil, right. They don't mix. Right. Right. But in soil systems, you have a lot of oil and you have a lot of water. You have a lot of fats. You yes. have things, olefins that just don't like water. They're hydrophobic. And here, here are these materials come along and they have a hydrophobic one end and hydrophilic on the other end, water loving, water hating. And they form what they call micelles. They actually are really cool looking things. They kind of form together. They can interact with both the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic fractions of soils. And that's the definition of amphiphilic? Yeah, they're a go-between. Okay. They provide the conditions to allow these materials to interact with each other in natural systems, whereas that wouldn't happen. So amphiphilic basically means it's, it's neither or it's both. It's both. It's both. Yes. Right. Yeah. So because of that, um, they, they can retain that, that helps the soil retain water. Let's say if the, uh, they capture water in that process. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. Yeah, yes. you're right. So now let's say if they're not there, water and it rains, water, boom, goes right through. At first, it saturates and it's saturated for some time. The forces of gravity work, uh, they're, they're, the forces of evaporation go at it, and the water goes away. If, if there is no humic substances. Ah. Right. So, so with humic substances, you have that retention, you have that medium, that, that porosity. Yes. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a tough term because, uh, you know, a lot of us in the turf industry, we think of hydrophilic uh, or hydrophobic, excuse me, as, as a really negative term. I mean, well, has anybody ever asked the question, what makes your soil or your turf hydrophobic? Did you ever ask that question? And what's the answer to that question? Lack of organic matter. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. And, and organic matter is what? It's both. Yeah. It's hydrophobic right. and hydrophilic, but it allows these core, the, they allow particles to stay apart instead of adhering to each other. And they allow that water to get down in there. There and it also go. at yeah. the same time absorbs some of it. So it's there and available to the plant when the plant needs it. There yeah. you go. It, uh, a hydrophobic soil, uh, water will beat up on the surface and mm -hmm. not enter. Um, mm -hmm. Because like you're saying, particles are just smashed together. There is yeah. no porosity. Compaction. <laughs> Compacted. Yeah. Water runs off on compacted soils. Compacted soils are usually low in organic matter and very, very low in biological activity, microbiological activity. Joel so uses we, that term friability. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a term my father taught me from the gardening world, but it's a great term, friability. And Gary Zimmer in the agriculture world calls it chocolate cake texture. I, I use the it. same term. I might have stolen it from him or maybe <laughs> yeah. from Jerry. I don't know. It crumbles. It crumbles. It crumbles. Yeah, it's, it's crumbly, a, yeah. yeah. You're and not going to achieve that on a PGA sand. Right. Medium, and that but. goes back to, you know, this, this little battle that we seem to have uh, with the turf bullies about, uh, you know, how base saturation turf works. Bullies. What we're trying to do is create a balance within the soil so that we have physics. So we have that friability concept 
and and on a high CEC soil, and we know this is difficult, if not impossible, to do on these lower CEC soils, soils that are below eight percent uh, or eight CEC. But on these higher CEC soils, where there's truly colloidal activity, we can create friability, and part of that process is by making sure that the biological system is working effectively to add yeah. uh, a concentration, if you will, of organic matter. So we can yeah. separate and create hydrophobic, hydrophilic environments it, and it provide has, more food yeah. substrates for right. biology. And, <laughs> it has and allow, to come from, it has to come from to biology. Eco-adaptive, what a concept. Yeah, it has to come from biology. We, we can't put a synthetic on there and achieve what biology achieves. Yeah. So all those characteristics have to come from living organisms. Lawrence, what's your take on um, adding biology to the soil? I mean, we, we do add uh, rhizobacteria. We mm -hmm. do add mycorrhizae. I mean, we have products that work with that. And we seem to find some great results with that. I and mean, they seem to jumpstart, especially in these soils where we are taking that half a step backwards because that's, you know, again, when the pilgrims came over to this country, they didn't walk across the countryside and find, oh, look, there's a golf course here. I mean, they just didn't mm -hmm. exist because man hadn't made one yet. So it's clearly a false environment. But because of that, we have to create, you know, we have to push to an extent. But what's your take on, on some of these um, biological inoculations? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Quite a few years ago, I was really opposed to using them because I realized, <laughs> because I realized that you have thousands and thousands of genre of microorganisms. Within the genre, you have thousands and maybe tens of thousands of species. Then within the species, you have no more tens of thousands of variants of of these species that are a little different than the other one. And you go, and you want to put two in three in <laughs> yeah, it's mm -hmm. like this baffled me however over the years there's been pretty solid research on developing organisms that are beneficial to soil interactions adding them seeing result a little better uptake of this or that or this so yeah it's got potential it's it's the question of how do we make it work in a very complex matrix um that's the big issue right there i, I think i know the answer <laughs> oh you do Share. Are you going to share it with us? Organic matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, if you put on chicken manure, and that's one thing. But if you put on composted chicken manure, you've just introduced these thousands, these millions, these yeah. gazillions of microorganisms into that soil. Some will Thank make you, it. Some won't. You know, we, you, you you've helped us uh, create a branding that we call Biocharge, which is the liquid products, uh, and mm -hmm. it's an extremely dynamic food source. Um, you know, that carries a certain um, mineral package. You know, we have phosphorus, we have potassium, we have nitrogen, uh, you know, we have calcium, magnesium, but, but everything that we've done, and, and, and again, uh, with, with your help and support, has been supported by this incredible package of foodstuffs that feed the microbes so that we can create this bioavailability. And I think that's what you're seeing the industry leading toward is, you know, you're seeing more use of carbon-based materials, fish meal, kelp meal, humic acids, uh, all these things, and for good reason. But certainly when, you know, when we started really working together on uh, and branding biocharge, that's really what the magic is behind this. I mean, we've got minerals and we've got synthetics in all of these products, but we have, uh, we have an incredible package of biological support that when it hits the soil, it jump starts the microbiology. So that we create this buffering and we start getting, you know, these little guys, as I say, you know, up and off to work and, you know, out the door. So that's, um, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, they can really, you know, sink their teeth into and, uh, and, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, that's been our foundation and uh, it seems to be working and, and same with the inoculants. <laughs> well, when I saw that term eco-adaptive chemistry, I read the details about it and what it was, that term was based on. And I think I was talking to you at the time. I said, that's exactly what we do. We've been yes. doing this since the eighties. We've already done this, but this mm -hmm. is exactly what we are doing. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the term came after, you know, our philosophy dictated right. that we have to do things a certain way to support nature. And uh, it's 
kind of cool as somebody so science is catching up with us that's kind of nice right. Absolutely. Absolutely. i mean think of it i mean we, we are a business and we're going to yeah. do everything we can to help uh, our, our friends and clients understand what our passion is. And when we all heard that phrase, and, 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 and particularly the phrase adaptive, I think yeah. we all just got very excited about it because that really is what we've been doing, you know, and what Jerry was doing. I mean, agrodynamics, I mean, mm -hmm. adaptive soil chemistry, you know, and soil bio, I mean, this is all fits into it, but it's a terminology that I think can help people understand this mm -hmm. dynamic and help people understand that what we're trying to do is make sure that ecology, make sure that biology, make sure that the, the micro, uh, you know, microbiology down there is, is, is adapting to the environment effectively and not being destroyed. And, and that's just, you know, that's why we wanted to get together today and have this conversation, because I think the term adaptive <laughs> is, is really the thing. It's not, it's not really hocus pocusy. And, you know, I, I think it's common sense. So for the first time, you know, and, and I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that when we have these conversations, because we can be a little heady at times, and we're, we're not trying to be, we're just trying to, um, you know, do the right thing for <clears throat> soils. But having yeah. that terminology, I think will help a lot of people understand that, that the biological environment under our feet is extremely adaptive to all sorts of things. I mean, if you look at the, uh, you know, that the documentary I keep, you know, talking about this fantastic fungi, you know, they talk about when, you know, when the cosmos came in and dropped all the, uh, you know, all, all their little, you know, uh, bombs and, the, and, you know, the earth was basically wiped out by, you know, all, all of the um, asteroids, and, asteroids. And, and dust that, that, right. uh, that, that blocked the sun. Yeah. What survived the Fungi, micro, baby. you know, microbiology yeah. and, and they ultimately, you know, mushrooms really is what, what we're talking <laughs> about. I mean, it's obviously much more complex than that. They were adaptive. They adapted to that environment. Uh, you know, they made changes and they, you know, and, and when, when we're all gone, you know, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, microbiology will still be there. They adapt. And, and what we're trying to do here is create a false environment in, in some of our landscapes. But as long as we can promote and allow uh, the environment to be adaptive, and that's what carbon-based fertility, biological soil management, doing a good job of getting your soil testing right, managing things like sodium and bicarbonates, but making sure that you've got the ability of, for your soils to adapt. And I think that's really uh, the magic and what we've been trying to do for all these years. And I think that's the passion that, you know, certainly Jack and I carry, and, and obviously you do Lawrence and, and our whole team. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. and a lot of our clients that see what we're doing <clears throat> for a reason. I mean, nobody here is making a ton of money, but we are incredibly passionate about what we do. And we've been criticized for a long time. And I got a couple of black guys most recently, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still a concept that, that I think holds true and, and makes an awful lot of uh, sense as, uh, as we go down there. We are running up against the clock. Uh, and I, I'm on a soapbox, so I've got to get off of that. <laughs> but I, I want you guys to have the last word here. So uh, let me start with you, Jack, and then I'm going to let Lawrence uh, close out. But any last thoughts that you have on this uh, incredibly huge subject that might sound extremely esoteric to a lot of people, but you can see we're passionate. Right. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it was covered and said, but um, that it's not necessary to understand and to and to reduce every single interaction down to a repeatable laboratory uh, uh, experiment. Oh, but great. but it but all you have to do is provide the right pathways and let nature do the rest. Uh, and and I think that's uh, that's something that obviously we're very passionate about, and I think we do a good job at always trying to discover ways to allow nature to do its work. Lawrence, I think that calling me a chemist is a reductionist attitude. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> I, after all these years you finally get it out <laughs> <laughs> okay if we're looking at chemistry as being combined with nature inspired technology complex bio geosystems and sustainability and green chemistry i don't think you just described a chemist 
You're exactly right. You're yeah. exactly right. And I apologize, my friend. Yeah. And I will never That's call okay. you a chemist again. What shall I call you? <laughs> Microbiogeological. I chemist. can't say all those words together. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. You're a biogeochemist. Yeah. 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 I yeah. am. You That's, really are. And Jerry yeah. was too. I mean, I mean. Oh, he, Jerry. Jerry understood it. He, very, he, I mean, he did. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead of his time. And, and, you know, and, 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 and really wasn't very. I mean, he didn't define it and, and really write it down in great detail, but he lived it. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. And if you read his book and you, you understand what it is we're talking about today, his book really goes through this whole process. I mean, it is well, dynamic. So when I, when I moved to Wisconsin back in the 70s, I needed a guiding principle and it became seek ye the truth and the truth shall set you free. Yes, it shall. Sounds like a song. And I think we should end on that. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I apologize for maybe this being a little off the top, but, but I think it's important that, you know, we, we help folks understand, uh, you know, that what we're dealing with in a, in a soils is an eco adaptive world. And, uh, and we are inspired by nature and this is about biological soil management. So if you are not uh, participating in the Earthworks podcast, please subscribe so that uh, you can hear uh, strange conversations like the one we just had. And, uh, and we'll have more of them as time goes on. And we'll certainly bring Lawrence back. Lawrence, thank you so much, Jack. Always uh, uh, thank you for participating. And, uh, and having said all that, thanks, guys. And we'll uh, thank you, Joel. Everybody. Thanks, Joel. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you.